Hi and welcome everybody to our event this morning and to your question Tom, now you should be hearing some audio and seeing some video as well. So before we get started, for those who do not know, the Energy Institute is an independent network of professionals spanning the whole energy system. Uh, they convene and facilitate debate and bring together expertise so that energy can be better understood, managed and valued. And today I'm here um, in my capacity as chair of this event. Normally I am the executive leader at GE Renewable Energy, um, but today I'm delighted to join the Energy Institute and everybody here on the call today to chair this session. We're going to focus today on process safety management as per the brief. We're going to talk about approaches to managing hazards and how to develop plant systems and procedures to prevent harm. This event itself is actually a precursor to the main Energy Institute Renewables Health, Safety and Sustainability Conference, which will be held in November this year. And in that seminar, we'll actually explore in much more depth some international best practice, some cross-sectorial learning to ensure we are managing and controlling hazards safely and responsibly. And I'd urge you to go on to the Energy Institute website at energyinst.org and book your place, have a look at the, the brief and the agenda for, those set, for that session in November. The Energy Institute itself um, provides lots of good practice resources in the form of technical guidance, research reports, um, specifications, test methods and even some videos to help enhance learning. And together with their partnership with the G Plus and Safety On, they're providing value added knowledge on current and future challenges that we face in the renewable energy sector. We have lined up some great speakers for the session today and the purpose and aim of today is to provide some bite sized learning opportunities and solutions in a very short space of time. We're going to have a few different parts to the day. We're going to have a fireside chat, first of all, followed by uh, two lightning talks from some great speakers. And then we'll finish with a Q&A session before concluding a, an hour and a half from now. So before we really get started and get into the general housekeeping, I'd like to thank our partners and sponsors for making this event possible. IBM, who is the Energy Institute's knowledge partner, and ERM, who we'll actually hear from shortly in the first session. For everybody attending on the call, please note that your microphone has been muted and your camera is disabled. I think we're all aware of bandwidth difficulties these days, so we're doing our best to make sure that you have good sound coming from all the speakers. The webinar will not run under Chatham House Rules. It will be recorded and hosted on the EI website, and a link will actually be sent to everybody who's participating in the seminar afterwards. Importantly, though, during the webinar, you will be able to sub submit questions to the speakers and then we will actually cover these in the Q&A session at the end of the session. So you will see on the, the screen in front of you on the bottom right, probably uh, some instructions from our moderator uh, where to log the questions. And ideally, if you can direct them to the person you wish, if you have a specific question and also introduce yourself a little in the question as well. So with that, with the basic housekeeping done, it's my pleasure to move on to the first and real part of the session today. So we're going to start off today with a fireside chat and we have two great speakers for you. First and probably known to a lot of people on the call, we have Trevor Johnson, who's the Her Majesty's Principal Inspector of Health and Safety at the Health and Safety Executive. Trevor was appointed Inspector of Health and Safety in 1989 and he's based, he was based then in the HSE's Newcastle under Lyme office. He was pr promoted to the HM Principal Inspector in 1999 and transferred to Edinburgh. He's been involved in regulation of a wide range of industries, including utilities and construction. In January 2012, he transferred to a new team in HSE's Energy Division to regulate offshore renewables. And then in 2017, the scope of his team was increased to include onshore wind. And it's my pleasure to welcome Trevor to the table today. And our second speaker in this session is Simon Burwood, 
chartered engineer and partner with ERM, one of our sponsors of the session. And Simon himself has worked in the specification design, management, assessment of safety related systems for over 19 years. He spent the early part of his career working in the machinery sector, designing and commissioning programmable safety functions for the manufacturing industry. He then moved into safety consultancy, specialising in 61, the IEC 61508 and 61511 compliance. In 2010, he co-founded Engineer and Safety Consultants, EFC, a specialist process and functional safety consultancy, which was then acquired by ERM in January of this year. January is, uh, Simon, sorry, is the UK representative on the IEC 61508 and 61551 International Maintenance Committees as a functional safety expert. And it's my pleasure to welcome you two gentlemen to the fireside chat today. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lisa, and, and thanks everyone for attending. Um, it's a, yeah, a bit of a bit of a strange setup with uh, <clears throat> really over video conferencing, but um, yeah, hopefully we'll have some some good conversation. Uh, yeah, we look forward to answering some of the questions. So I've got a few questions uh, to fire at yourself, then, Trevor. I, I thought a good way to start would be. Um, a pretty wide ranging question in what are the key major process hazards that are associated with renewables? Uh, well, uh, hi Simon, thank you uh, for asking me such an interesting question. I suppose in, 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 in modern day, I, I, the first thing I have to do is to make sure you can actually hear me. <laughs> and I'm not on mute, but it seems to be the most engaged at, at, at the current time. Um, but, but I think I, I'm as, as uh, Lisa said, I've been with HSE for 51 years. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the last uh, eight to nine years have been the, well, the most interesting, very, very interesting career. And that's because, you know, the industry in the industry in particular is, you know, really just being sort of challenging for the users to make a difference. It's really interesting. And there are a wide range of issues that can be dealt with. It's in, in a way, I think the uh, offshore wind industry was a, a mix of different industries with these sort of unique environments. Uh, it does serve from construction and utilities and from the marine environment. Um, and, and, but, but when you look at it, there are a number of major hazards potentially within that. During the construction so, right, it, it, you're not coming through very clearly. I don't know whether it's the headset or... Uh, I'm not sure. Is it really problematic? Uh, is that, I don't know if you've changed anything, but that sounds much better. Right, okay. Apologies, yeah. That, that's no, no, I, 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 I seem to be getting quite a bit of feedback as well. So maybe that's a part of the problem. Shall we try to continue? I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's, as I was saying, it's a really interesting industry. Um, and, you know, for, for me, one of the big issues are to do with work on a high production activity, uh, diving operations, aviation, marine operations, also the huge with uh, the introduction of uh, new technology hydrogen and plugs and wind as well. Okay. All right, thanks, Trevor. I mean, one of the things I find quite interesting, on a high level, renewable energy projects seem to have less severe process and operating risks uh, compared to sort of traditional oil and gas facilities when it comes to, to process safety. What are some of the specific areas or challenges that exist in, in renewables projects face that are not already faced by the oil and gas industry? In, 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 in a way, I, I slightly disagree with the uh, basic assumption. Uh, and this is why I think this is a really interesting question. And I actually thank you for asking it because I think, think sometimes it can be perceived that uh, you know, the offshore renewable industry, the wind industry, uh, is 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 not as challenging as the oil and gas industry, and it's that's not the case. Um, and again, I think it's always interesting, you know, people who want to transfer into the industry to recognise that it is a different industry uh, and that you need to the the. Um, the the profile is. I, I, I just 
I'd also make the point I, that I, I, so I would also make the point that um, the UK within this, this is an international industry, has only, uh, has faced the uh, and the, the health and safety standards which have been adopted across uh, the international sort of sphere of, uh, of the Australian industry have come from uh, the, the, the highly competent skilled people from within the United Kingdom, and I think we recognise that. But there are a number of people forward, uh, and you know, for me, one of the key ones is about you know, ensuring designers have the hierarchy of controls to eliminate risk as possible. Um, you know, to enable the offshore industry needs to become more diverse, there's no doubt, and within uh, the industry strategy, there's a requirement to increase the number of women working in the industry. We need to ensure there are no health and safety barriers to those women entering the industry. Uh, and that we know the workforce because the, the industry is set to expand and the number of employees will come in uh, to the industry is, is, is set to grow. And the figures that's about 40,000 direct employees by 2026. And we need to have provision all provided with the right training information and supervision that is competent and safe. I think there's other challenges ensuring you know, the industry success is often partly based upon cost reduction. We can't allow that to be an excuse to compromise our opportunity. Again, my final point is this industry is full of really good people, and we need to improve the presentation to the best out of it. Hopefully, hopefully that's the best Simon. Yeah, I, I think they're all really, uh, really interesting points there, Trevor. Yeah, I mean, following on from your final point there, um, I mean, generally speaking, what are the skill sets required to manage process safety in, in renewables? And I guess importantly, uh, the existing skill sets that exist in, say, the oil and gas sector, are they transferable? Again, maybe, but not definitely. And, and, and again, I think it's in part due to the attitude of the person who comes into the, to the industry. I think if they come with an open mind, they, they will have a certain set of basic skills which will be very helpful, but they have to adapt to the risk profile within the, within the industry and in that. And the, and the first thing is to get to understand the industry, the uh, uh, guidelines produced by the, by, by the G Plus on the Energy Institute website. There's a lot of really good stuff in there, which would enable people to, 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 to make that into the industry. Because a lot of the safety principles will apply, you know, um, in terms of the, the, the skills of health and safety management will still apply. So that's you know from the basic plan do check in to, to sort of what the basics of process safety as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean my view is you know process safety management gives us a really good framework and some of the techniques that we apply through each stage of this framework may be slightly different, but the overall frame, framework should uh, probably apply equally. I, I, I totally agree uh, with, with, with that. And again, you know, as you said, so rightly say, the same principles apply. And I think in terms of process safety in particular, there are certain elements of it which will have its play a part in improving health and safety in, in the renewal sector as well. But so, for instance, when it comes to sort of planning a project, you know, a hazard study or a hazard study or something similar to that. Will enable the industry to you know, have a better chance to eliminate all the risk in that stage. I think that is the key. Also, measuring performance with both leading and lagging indicators. I think sometimes we need to look at other situations where we, you know, where things have not gone well. Will we look at where, where we are well managed? Will we look at where we are well managed? And again, I think that 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 is important. You know, just for instance. Uh, you know, the checking of uh, documents to do with the high voltage electricity should, should enable those le uh, leading uh, in indicators to be developed. And again, it's like if you're using uh -huh. information to improve going forward. Don't overwhelm yourself with trivia. Find the important stuff and use that to go forward. And again, that's, that needs for continual review and improvement. Brilliant. Thanks. Simon, before you move on to your next question, but um, there's a lot of back on the line. It would probably be useful for the participants, I think, if you could summarise some of the answers Trevor has given, um, so that we can try and make sure everybody can uh, catch the main points. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I'll, I'll try and go back a 
it's just, um, I mean, really, again, leading on to the previous point there, Trevor. So fundamentally, how different is it managing process safety in the renewable sector compared to petrochemical, chemicals, oil and gas? I mean, I think, you know, I think the, the biggest difference is, is going to be there is no hydrocarbon risk or very limited hydrocarbon risk. Having said that, going forward, you know, if we end up with uh, turbines with you know, producing green hydrogen at the same time, then that situation is going to change enough. But I do think the biggest thing that can be learned is that they need to be proactive. We don't make things go wrong before acting. I think the 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 more in the other case of planning and developing projects for health and safety, the better we will be able to Yeah. Absolutely. So I guess just to summarise and fundamentally, the biggest change is there's a very limited hydrocarbon uh, exposure in renewables, the exception being potentially uh, generation of hydrogen, um, where it's being compressed, stored and, and transferred, for example. There's um, similar risks, I guess, there to, in, in comparison to hydrocarbons to sort of summarise Trevor's point there. Um, so, so a final question for you, really, Trevor, which um, I guess summarises some of the previous ones we've discussed. So what kind of process safety lessons learned from the oil and gas sector can we apply into renewables? Yeah, so uh, uh, I, 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 again, I, I think it is about developing the right uh, performance methods which the, I know the industry have done well to bring that into the renewable sector, into the renewable se uh, um, um, uh, uh, setting, just to ensure uh, that we have that continual improvement that we need. I mean, we have a reasonably good health and safety record, but no one, no one who, who is in this industry would argue against the need for further improvement. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Trevor. The um, a question just coming on the chat, apologies if I'm stepping out of the, um, the agenda here, but I thought it was an interesting one to raise from Atul. Are there any specific modifications to the tools and techniques, such as HAZOP and HAZID, um, which were developed for chemical process hazards and, and oil and gas? Uh, the techniques probably will, will work. It's just adapting them to the technology and the uh, and, and the uh, hazards and risks of the, the sector, um, but, the, but the basic techniques should should work. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, interesting. One of the things we've been working on at ERM is using some of the fairly complex complex modelling tools that we've got for uh, dispersion and adapting that to things like um, ice being thrown from blades from uh, wind turbines, for example. So there's, there's uh, yeah, there's a lot already in place that we can lean on to uh, to help manage process safety. I think. And just another another question, if I may, then Trevor, why is there no safety case regime for offshore wind similar to what we have for oil and gas? Um, I, 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 again, I think this is um, you know a, a really interesting question, and it's one I've been looking at. Uh, Eight years uh, now, uh, and, uh, and we've, you know, we continue to look at it and 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 review it. And I keep going back to that that that, that there's two really difficult points I I, I I I would make. In in essence, and let's hope this never ever happens in the oil and gas sector or the renewable sector or any other sector. But we, I I I don't think there is a potential for the pipe rail for that big explosion to where you, where the public needs that reassure that duty holders are doing all the right things and satisfying the regulator via a safety case that they've got in place all the right, all the right procedures and, and processes, et cetera, et cetera. The other point I would make is that whether it's a safety case re regime and people talk about as always reasonable and practical or the, the regime under the HSW Act, both are defined by so far as reasonable and practical and both require the same high standard uh, for, for each other, and again, please, I, I, and I, and I the, the the only difference should be between the two, is that you don't need to produce, you know, that that you know uh, that large safety case to go to work, but in both situations you have to provide the same performance level of performance, 
same level of standards to ensure people's health and safety are, are, are protected. Super, thanks Trevor. I'm just going to go back, if you don't mind, and we've got a few minutes here. Um, I think I was causing the audio issues by the looks of it. So I'll, I'll just fire another question at you, if I may, um, just going back to what we discussed. Um, what are the skill sets required to manage process safety and renewables? And are the existing skill sets from uh, the oil and gas sector transferable? And this time I'll mute my microphone, hopefully it'll be a bit clearer. Um, I think I think it's not a given that they are all transferable by, by all people. I mean, and you no, know, you'd probably expect a civil servant to come out with an answer like maybe, but not definitely. And I think that is 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 a key to this because I do think the, the, the whereas those basic skills can be adopted and adapted uh, to the renewable sector, the person who comes into the industry from say the oil and gas industry has to be. Um, uh open-minded they have to want to learn and they have to understand uh the uh the uh, risk profile the hazard profile of the renewable sector and see where the priorities are once they do that and apply those basic principles then they they they, they um then they should enable uh you know, whether it's an individual project or the in wider industry to make those those improvements that the industry needs to make Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. And um, so that's all the questions I had for the uh, for the fireside talk. So yeah, thanks very much for that, Trevor. I've got some really interesting points and um, yeah, some good points of discussion there. So at this I'll hand back over to Lisa uh, for the next presentation. Thank you very much, Simon and Trevor. And Simon, thank you for working out what the technical issue was with the sound. Perfect. So we are a little bit ahead of schedule. So um, with that, let me move on anyway to introduce our first lightning talk, um, which is an insight into the Energy Institute's process safety management framework. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Stephen Bater, Chartered Engineer and Fellow of the, industry, uh, the Energy Institute. Stephen has over 35 years experience in the major hazard energy and renewable energy industries. He's a world expert on leadership, process safety, occupational health and safety, and environmental and energy management, as well as the establishment and implementation of key performance indicators, KPIs, for major hazard industries. He has a doctorate in leadership and has developed numerous transformational change programmes and has also written the update of the Energy Institute's process safety management framework. He is well placed to provide a unique insight into how organisations can verify its risk management systems to ensure that their operations are safe, compliant and meet their fiscal targets. So Stephen, um, you actually have a few extra minutes uh, today, so please, uh, if you can, make use of them. And again, a small reminder to everybody on the session, please pop your questions into the Q&A box and we will take them at the end. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, Lisa. Can you confirm that you are unmuted? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for the introduction, Lisa. I'm just going to give you a quick run through uh, the Energy Institute's high-level process safety management framework, and also some tools and techniques that may be able to help and to pro socialise process safety management in the renewable energy sector. So, process safety. What does it actually mean? For the context of this presentation is managing the systems and procedures that prevent uncontrolled release of energy. PSM is vital to ensuring safe and continued operations in major accident hazard operations and organisations, basically preventing fatal, serious injury and catastrophic incident potential. We contextualise it in the renewable energy sector. If you think of concentrated solar power, major accident hazard potential, i.e. a fire explosion, Wind energy, collapse of structures, electricity, vessel collision, hydroelectric, dam breach, electricity, 
Ocean energy, tidal wave, new and emerging technologies, collapse of structures, vessel collisions, electricity, biomass, fire explosions, hydrogen, fire explosion, biofuels, fire explosion. So if you think of the parallels with the oil and gas industry discussed earlier by Simon and Trevor, they're, they're, they're there in this sector. There have been a number of incidents at AD plants and substations that have resulted in large energy releases, explosions and spillages, several of which have resulted in multiple fatalities, serious injuries, environmental damage and huge financial loss. So these uh, major hazards, accident scenarios and mates, major accident to the environment, are uh, definitely most potential in the new and emerging renewable energy sector. So I uh, asked the question, the CEO's challenge in this sector, new people, new entrants, Process safety management. So, what are the key things? Don't hurt anyone. Don't harm the environment. Make or exceed the fiscal target. What the management need to know? How likely am I to have an incident-free day tomorrow? They need to address the key questions. How will we do that? What can go wrong? What systems are in place to prevent things going wrong? How will we know we are doing it? Will these systems work when needed? I think means I don't know. So that's a question to you guys, your management and your operational teams and the leadership, ask yourself. Regulators expectations, three key things that must be answered. From the boardroom down, do we understand what can go wrong? Do we know what systems are in place to prevent things going wrong? Do we know that these systems are working effectively? So the six tenets of process safety along the lines of the framework are senior leaders in renewable energy operations need to satisfy themselves that major accidents and hazards are recognized and the worst potential consequences are understood throughout the business. That's from the top to the bottom. Plant and equipment are provided which is fit for purpose to reduce these risks from the major hazards to a tolerable level as just been presented. Systems and procedures are provided which ensure proper operation for the plant and equipment and which is maintained their integrity throughout the operational life cycle. Sufficient staff with appropriate experience and training are provided to implement these systems and procedures, including making staff aware of the appropriateness of process safety management techniques, tools and processes that can be implemented to keep safe operations. Emergency preparedness that responds adequately to foreseeable incidents that are both in place and practiced periodically. Incident investigation and monitoring and auditing of performance take place in order to learn from experience and promote continuous improvement. So the ES, EI process safety management framework represents the current energy, sorry, the current energy industry's process safety management good practice. Seen as a de facto international standard, a compressive, comprehensive and structured approach the PSM endorsed by the UK HSE. How did it come around? The framework was developed with workshops, participants, representing a cross section of the energy industry, industry sectors, stakeholders, including industry insurers, UK HSE. Subsequent wider stakeholder review. So basically, the framework was developed by the industry for the industry. What is involved? There are four focus areas, four high level key components of the framework, 20 elements, key aspects of the operation we need to manage appropriately in order to ensure the integrity of the operation, 200 things we should be doing in order to ensure the integrity of the operation, and a very comprehensive set of guidelines of how to meet the expectations, good practices, process safety performance indicators. Drilling down a little bit, the four key element areas are process safety, risk identif identification and assessment, risk management, review and improvement. So there are 20 elements. Uh, one, as with everything, leadership, commitment, responsibility. It has to start at the top. Identification of compliance with legislation and industry standards, employee selection, placement and competency, and health assurance, so the occupational health element. Workforce involvement, communication with stakeholders. Moving on to identification and assessment, hazard identification or risk assessment. The tools were presented earlier with my colleagues, and they are and they do work in this sector. Documentation, records, and knowledge management. Risk management, 
operating manuals and procedures, process and operational status monitoring and handover, management and operational interfaces, standards and practices. Key again in all operations of high hazard industry is management of change and project management. Operational readiness and process startup. And again, don't forget emergency preparedness and response. Inspection, maintenance, and asset integrity. Management of safety critical and environment critical devices. Work control, permit to work, and task risk assessment. Contract and supply selection and management. Review and improvements. Incident report and an investigation. Assurance, audit, management review and implementation and intervention, i.e. continuing improvement. The elements, there are 20 key aspects of operation we need to manage appropriately in order to assure the integrity of the operation. Each of the 20 elements has a series of expectations that set the requirements for meeting the aims of the objectives of each element. Expectations are the things we should be doing in order to ensure the integrity of the operation. Uh, I've worked with my colleagues in the Energy Institute to actually rewrite the, 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 the revision of it. We've also developed several tools, one of which is linked to the process safety performance indicators. It's EI process safety performance measures. This is a fully online tool that's uh, enabled to understand how likely we are to have an incident free day tomorrow, have an up to date, clear, and consistent understanding of compliance and performance levels across your organization on an absolute basis relative to their peers, identify areas of strength and weaknesses versus the recognized framework. It's given, it's a visualized thing, gives real-time information, it's a user-friendly, and it's fully aligned to the framework. It gives you a dashboard that selects key metrics of the 200 performance indicators of the 20 elements. It's menu-driven, so it can be se selected, uh, omitted as appropriately, and it can give you a real-time visualization on any device, any tablet, anywhere in the world, and also to align with sites of different operational uh, focus. So, you, in other words, you can benchmark across the whole operation portfolio. Again, as we add its goals, it was mentioned earlier, we've also engaged now with an audit application that's fully aligned. The application allows for a systematic and robust audit of the process safety management system by internal and external auditors. This allows for a consistent approach to the audits and reporting to identify any gaps and inform continued, continually improvements. To, to be a value, senior management should be fully committed to the concept of auditing and its effective implementation within your organization, linked to the PSPIs and the auditing, the old adages, if it's measured, is managed. The application allows senior management to see real-time visualization, visualization and tracking of compliance. Same as the other application, is fully aligned to the process safety focus areas, each element, it gives a representation of the compliance against the framework. As I say, it can be bespoke or it can be taken out that some elements may not be appropriate for that sector of renewable energy, but it can be fully aligned to the organizational needs and requirements. So that's a quick run through guys. Any questions now, or if you want to carry the questions to the Q&A, back to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, no questions yet in the chat box for you or the quick Q and A box. So, but certainly I have a few that um, we'll we'll take at the end of the session for you. Thank you very, Thank much, you very much. I'll mute my mic. Thank you. Thank you. So our our next session is actually going to be uh, another lightning talk, and it's how we have shifted from a traditional HS and E approach to more of an inclusive approach. And it's my pleasure to welcome Marcus Peters to the session today. Marcus um, is a fellow of the Energy Institute and he's also the head of HSE Offshore globally for RWE Renewables UK. Marcus is an experienced senior HSE professional who has worked in a variety of industries in a range of senior management positions. He's currently responsible for leading HSE at Renewables, RWE Renewables across their offshore wind portfolio but has actively been involved in a, for many years in a number of key renewable industry, global and regional working groups and organisations such as G+, GWO, Renewables UK and VGB. He's a Chartered Fellow of IROSH and, as I mentioned, a Fellow of the Energy Institute. 
Marcus, I'll hand over to you and you have a few extra minutes if you need them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I take it we can all hear me and see my presentation. Should be the start. All good. Excellent. All good. Well done. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for everybody for joining. Um, what I want to do is really try and give our perspective on what process safety means to us as a business and how we've gone about tackling the subject, um, which can, for some people, seem like a complex approach. Uh, and we try to simplify it where we can. I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that the RW Renewables is the, the only way to do this. I'm just saying that this is how we've approached it. So hopefully uh, some of you on the on the call may be getting some ideas and, and, and happy to answer any questions or take comments afterwards. Um, my first involvement really in process safety came many years ago um, when I was in E.ON. Um, and I joined the E.ON organisation. It was really my first step into, pro into or, you know, sort of the energy sector for many years. I left the Royal Navy about 1997 and I spent two or three years in the energy sector in uh, constructing power stations on the traditional side, so thermal and nuclear. Um, and process safety was very much talked around coming from the oil and gas sector. And then I was in mainstream construction and it you know, we didn't really deal with it in that sector. And then I joined E.ON and was made head of engineering governance. And it was at the time around Texas City and the Baker report. And at that time, the E.ON board in the UK wanted all of the businesses to adopt an engineering approach that considered process safety. So when we went to start talking to the oil and gas team that we had, they immediately got it. We talked to the generation guys and after a while they got it. We then started to talk to the grid business. They didn't get it. And why are you talking to us? And we got to some of the businesses dealing with the likes of district heating schemes and that, and they definitely didn't get it. Um, so that was an interesting sort of challenge. And over the last few years, um, I worked for E.ON. And then as you'll see that we moved to RWE Renewables a couple of years ago. And at the same time, the conversation started was how do we implement uh, asset and plant safety, as we call it, um, across the, the globe, across all the areas we, we, we sort of function. So that's sort of a bit of the background to this. Um, who are we as RWE Renewables? Well, we are part of the RWE group and we were formed a few years ago from the integration of E.ON Climate and Renewables and from Energy Renewables. And currently we're sitting across the globe, uh, operating in 20 plus countries um, with various development projects, uh, operational sites, uh, construction projects, which we wholly own and those that we are in JV setups with. Um, and we're mainly focused in four key areas, onshore wind, offshore wind, utility solar PV and energy storage. Um, within that, we also have new technologies, so we are heavily involved in the hydrogen ramp up. Um, we're also heavily involved in some of the demonstrator projects for the likes of floating wind and some also some of the airborne wind and newer technologies. Three focused geographies. So we're in the Americas, Europe and Asia Pacific. And my role and that of my colleagues in the leadership team for um, the business are really about joining up a one fleet approach wherever we can and having a global approach as a baseline and we only tend to have national um, differences um, if there's an absolute need for. So we'll always try and have a fleet approach. You can see that from our demographic spread, we have pretty much a large focus in North America. Um, and currently in our onshore fleet, we've got about 1500 people working across multiple turbine types. We've got heavy solar and battery in there. We have similar in Europe, and we have similar in sort of Asia Pacific in some markets um, and we have some you know, quite considerable growth aspirations. But it gives you that challenge to what does terminology mean within that? And one of the first things to note is that we hit a, a sort of a, a bit of a roadblock when we started to talk about process safety, because in US process safety has very defined meaning. And when we started to talk about what we wanted to do around this subject, it was very clear that it was causing some problems. 
So what we tried to do was to change the terminology. So the intention of what we, the subject we manage, the subject and how we approach it is the same, but we just have a very different uh, terminology to that. That also came about in some of the, the, the pooling tests that we did with our global sort of colleagues and partners to really try and focus on, you know, what is a traditional approach here? And what was very clear is a lot of people talked about having safety moments and safety days. And there was a clear mindset looking at, you know, occupational safety, which is where most people step into the world of HSE. You know, there is a focus on the people side of things. Um, I always joke that, you know, H and S is a very small H and a very big S. Um, and we need to get the H clearly a lot bigger. And, and that's something we as a business are very focused on. But also it, it's, we have to understand that it's a very complex area nowadays. It shouldn't just be about safety. So we've come up with a slightly different approach and we describe it as a culture of care is what we want to adopt as a business. And we have this um, sort of poster that we use and a phrase and within RW Renewables, we use this we care today so everyone enjoys tomorrow. So we have a clearly defined behavior that we want everybody to adopt and we want everybody to have a, a clearly defined output, which is that everyone enjoys tomorrow. And that's something that we, we reflected upon and how do we relate that beyond the traditional, just, you know, safety. And what we found was um, we got to a point where we want really people to consider the mindset that they bring to work. We want to consider how their behavior and their actions affect themselves, others, but also how does it affect the asset? And we want people to not just to think about when they're doing switchgear operation, about the mindset when they operate the switchgear, but what about our people that are designing switchgear, that are specifying switchgear? that are looking at those design interfaces, which is the, you know, the thing that Trevor was talking about. Because if you really want to approach process safety in the right way, you have to start when it's in a very early stage design. We have to consider not just the constructability, but the operability and the decommissioning, which is something that we, you know, all industries face. And you know, the renewables industry is often sold as a, a new industry, but you know, I've been in this industry 13 years, um, we're already going to starting to look at decommissioning sites that were installed in that period. Most sites will have a 20 to 25 year lifespan. So we have to start considering that. And therefore we have to really change our mindsets because the problem with that is that a lot of people come into the industry and there are some paradigms because when you start mentioning phrases like process safety or asset and plant safety, and you describe that, then the paradigms raise their head. You know, we don't deal with hydrocarbons. We're not major accident hazard. Most of our assets are unmanned. And that convinces people that they don't need to take this seriously. So we really tried to change that view. And the way that we did that is we have what we call the foundation is the culture of care. And we divide our approach into five pillars. And those pillars support us getting to enjoy tomorrow. So the H in the H&S is the well-being section. Occupational safety is the traditional approach. And then we have asset and plant safety, the, the central pillar. This is what we traditionally would call process safety. And it is the thing that we try and really promote. So for us, it's definitely a, a focus for the business. But we then split down local environment, which is those traditional environmental management, you know, your spills, your flora, your fauna, those type of factors. And also then we have those things which are a bit more abstract, the planet and society. What does sustainability mean? What does local sourcing of supply chains mean? You know, what's the global impact stuff like CO2 emissions? So we try and break it down into those five pillars so that we have a slightly more mature approach, but at the same time, a simpler approach where we just say, to people that we need you to care on a daily basis around these five focus areas. And what it brings to the table is th this focus around, you know, switching from occupational safety. And the key thing for us is to really try and get away from, you know, th these boards that you see with the number of days since a lost time accident. Because when you actually look at it, 
you know, people take a lot of comfort from statistics and it impacts the mindset they have, whether they're a technician or a manager. Because to most people, if you see a, a board like that, it means success, that it's a safe site. So actually, you know, I don't have to take care in this around this site because it's a safe site. But also when somebody does have an incident involving an asset or involving themselves, they don't want to be the one that tells anybody because they don't want to set that board to zero. And there is a question about how many sites have you ever been to with those boards that says zero, 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 one. And it's the first day since a lost time accident. So it doesn't really tell you much, but more importantly about the integrity of the engineering assets that we have, it tells us absolutely nothing. It really doesn't focus at all. And what we want people to do is to respect fully deal with the assets that we have, make sure that we design them right, that we install them right, we operate them right, and we take a responsible caring approach to that as much as we do around caring for our people. And realistically, you know, the, the conversations came from a lot of the discussions around Texas City, and it was a bit of a game changer from many traditional industries, but also the non-traditional industries so those outside of the petrochem and the oil and gas and the Texas report, city report, you know, which we often refer to as the bake report is freely available on the Internet. It's very well worth reading if anybody hasn't read it, but it really does give some really good indication as to why we should approach this and take things like the EI's framework seriously. And what it also introduces is this thing, you know, that companies often have which is where risks become a normative condition. And it's, you know, all organizations really should fear the risk of normalization. It's just what happens around here. You know, you get this a lot in the maritime industry when we're talking to vessel operators, when, you know, you just, you talk to stevedores, they've got fingers missing and they just say, well, that's just part of the job, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. You're not in the 21st century, it shouldn't be. And we have to try and break through this normative condition. There's an example there, you know, if you take a five year period, everybody had heard about Texas City and Deepwater Horizon. But in between that, organizations were suffering significant incidents in one geographical area. But if you treat them in individual incidents and not look at the collective, then very much it's, you know, being seen as a silo. So we need to see that recurring picture. We need to be mindful of not becoming a normative organization risk shouldn't be normative so the challenge really is to really say well okay you know what should we do around this this subject and how do we really try and understand it and the problem is as we said before you know high hazard complex risk organizations such as oil and gas and nuclear and petrochem they get this straight away but a lot of the new players in the renewables market say well that's not us so if you switch it around and say well actually it's about potential release or significant release of energy then and, and just say from assets then you can take this approach but you have to then start to look at the underlying challenges and you have to then challenge both design engineers and the engineering functions and the ops people to say you know are we confident that we know what risks are posed by our engineering assets but more importantly do we know the current risk levels from those assets do we understand how the risks are controlled? It's okay saying, well, on, a, on a, a diagram, we have a pressure relief valve, but the pressure relief valve is only as good as it's tested and as it is if it's suitable and fit for purpose. Have we documented the performance we assume we get from those risk controls and we close the gap between what we assume is gonna happen in, a, in an uncontrolled release right, sort of um, event versus what we actually know will happen because we've got confidence in those controls. And that comes down to the frequency of the checks we make, the reassessment and the levels of the risks that we find, and then going back and also managing the changes to any process or asset. And that's a really key, you know, having good change management documents. It starts really where you identify and understand your assets and risks. And what we had to do as a business is really to look at it and say, you know, what are our assets? And there are some that traditionally companies might not put on there, like helicopters and crew transfer vessels. But, you know, each each of those have 
potential for energy release. So why would we not treat them exactly the same as we would anything like a battery storage or on a turbine and a generator? Why would we treat it differently? If we approach it with the same mindset, then absolutely we can get through this. And one of the things that we need to try and do then is once we have these assets is to start to think about what can go wrong. And we have within the industry, many of these incidents that happen where there's events that happen to the asset, whether there are people there or not. And it really changes how people think. But it's not just in renewables. And, and this is one of my favorite examples where a UK supermarket, you know, had a coffee machine and they had it on their asset register as a coffee machine. There was no risk identified other than the steam could cut, you know, scold a customer. That was it. And it, on the on the day in question, um, there was an event where there was an explosion with a coffee machine because they didn't appreciate the stored energy within it. They didn't appreciate it for what it is, a pressure vessel. And effectively, what had happened was the, the supermarket coffee um, sort of bistro person had basically phoned up the maintenance helpline to say, this thing keeps venting. The maintenance team had come out. They'd fitted a pressure relief valve as per the instruction, but they didn't check the PRV level. Um, and the PRV was the wrong rating. In the end, the, the machine went bang. The, when they did the subsequent checks of the, all the machines, the vast majority had the wrong pressure relief valves fitted in the first place. So it had a massive effect on their asset fleet. But more importantly, there was reputational damage. There were people injured. Um, and it took a, a, that event to have an awakening to say, how do we manage our assets? So even something like a supermarket coffee machine we can approach with the same mindset. So what do we do? We, we Well, the, pro, the traditional way is that we have a very linear way of looking at incidents. And what we have to try and get our incident investigation teams to look at, but also we have to look ahead of any incidents happening. We have to get away from this linear approach. So what we've tried to do is to try and say, OK, let's educate people around this. Let's try and change people's mindsets. Let's try and break down those paradigms. Focus on energy release. Focus on that uncontrolled energy release. Focus in on how do we design it in the first place and how do we control it? What are our mitigators? What are our barriers? Because ultimately, it is about the adoption of the right mindset. It's about really looking at those design interfaces. And within the renewable sector, the, the complexity of design interfaces are becoming more and more. We have, you know, not just the connection to grid, but we're going to have connection to hydrogen assets and high pressurized pipelines and electrolyzers and storage tanks. So there's a huge amount of interfacing now going on over the last couple of years, which is becoming ever more complex. And we have to recognize that, you know, we want people to recognize that the complexity that, you know, they need to understand that there are different risks and it's often a disjointed approach. It is more complex than just saying something is a safety risk. I mean, realistically, what we tend to do within the asset and plant safety um, organization is really look at the bow tie analysis. And we like bow ties because it doesn't necessarily have to give you 10 to the minus six. It doesn't look at it in, in a way that is so complex that the average technician either switches off or doesn't understand it. It's easy to explain to all parts of the organization to say, okay, let's map out an event. Let's look at what could lead to it and what could lead from it. Let's look at our common barriers and mitigators, and we can then use those within the auditing process for our sites. And what it leads to is a far more interesting conversation that we have. And what we're trying to get away from is this organizational drift. We need people to understand that once you have that mapped out, it's about knowing how effective things are going to be. It's a bit like having an RCD that you never ever check. And on the day in question when it's needed, it's welded on and it doesn't work. It's still on paper a control measure, but if the control measure is not effective and it's not tested and it's not inspected on a regular basis, then its effectiveness is in question. And that's the problem that we have. We back to this normalization that we need to get away from. We often preach about the wisdom of Donald, which is a very famous speech that Donald Rumsfeld used 
but we can use it in the context of our assets because when you use that phraseology that's on the screen with your, your, your teams, get them to really think about it, then you know, it comes down to how confident are we in what we know about our assets and controls and their current condition here today. Not last week or last year, here today, because it's here today that it might be needed. And that's where we try and get people to think. And what we're trying to do is bridge that gap between their perception and the reality. And to do that, we try and simplify our message. So when we talk about asset and plant safety, we talk about it, there's two different approaches. In occupational safety, then people will bump into the asset. Asset and plant safety is about stopping the asset or plant bumping into people. And it's about engaging with people at all levels of the organization to explain that. And what we find is, it's a simple message, people buy into it, and you can then complex, add some layers of complexity and frameworks beyond that. But keep it at its basic level, people really understand the difference. And it's really about them reflecting on their assets, perceived conditions, and those level of controls versus that reality. So in our fundamental sort of approach, what we're telling to the teams are, do you understand what can go wrong? Do you understand the events that can go wrong within your asset that you are responsible for or that you are designing? Do you understand the barriers that are in place to stop it happening? And do you have assurance? And what assurances are you building in around this? And what, you know, that goes whether it's the ops team, whether that's the construction teams, or whether that's within the design house. And to do that, we've set ourselves a framework. So the framework is a very simplistic approach, but it talks about what we shall do as an organization. So we'll make sure that we design, construct, operate, maintain, modify, and dispose of those assets in compliance with the laws and industry standards. But more importantly, we'll implement effective, efficient transport management of asset-based risks associated with our activities. And to do that and achieve that second bullet point, we have to ask ourselves a question, what is our portfolio? What assets do we have? How effective are, are we managing them? So it's really then looking at the detail that sits behind that. And examples of what comes out of that, then we have what we call safety critical information. Um, so when we have asset events, um, then we will produce lessons learned, we will produce alerts, we will produce information notices. When we get them from the OEMs, um, we will also look into them, work with the OEM to make sure that we have the right information that we can share and we share with the industry. We have a bow tie process that produces barrier based risk management and we use that in a variety of ways. But also we have clear APS incident monitoring and investigation teams that look at that. And we make sure that we have asset and plant safety specifications in our technical supply agreements. So they're in the turbine supply agreements we have with the OEMs. They're in with the switchgear manufacturers. We make sure that we talk to the grid people when we're building substations and having grid co discussions. And then what we also measure is we have technical due diligence reports. So we, before we purchase an asset, we will have a team that look at it from a technical due diligence point of view. And then we'll produce bow ties and then we measure those bow ties about surveys completed versus the barriers that we require to put in place. So all in all, we're managing this um, both in a proactive sense and a reactive sense. When you look at the bow tie and how a bow tie forms, it ends up looking like that. And that's a, a live example of one of our uh, sort of bow ties. And what we're really looking at is in the green boxes, it's the expected barriers. We're looking at the blue boxes, which are enhanced barriers that we want to put in place. The black barriers, the ones that are already there. So it's really about looking at it. You can go beyond minimum, you know, uh, that is required. We can enhance things and make it safe. And what we're really looking at is the missing barriers as well. We're trying to identify those missing barriers within that process. And we use these in audits with our sites. When we take sites over, we'll use them to audit the, the, the assets that we're there adopting. Um, but also we use them on a regular basis uh, on our audit frequency to make sure that we really understand with the teams, uh, you know, what events can happen from their assets 
and we raise the awareness that way. And we're looking for examples like this, where you can see the reds, we've identified some barriers missing. So there we need to put a capex in, or we need to retrofit um, some of those areas that, that are missing. But we're also confident where we've got barriers present. And where we look at it, we're looking at redundancy barriers as well as part of that audit process. Finally, is the regulator's view. This was produced a few years ago by the HSC, but we use it internally um, when we're doing our training with our teams. It's not the fact that it's the HSC and Trevor's on the line. I think if you took the regulator's view away, this is just good questions that you should ask as a business. You know, and when you look at the question sets there, which will be in the slide pack, you know, I challenge everybody to really see if you can answer those questions for your business, because the answers that you get from that really give you a view as to how you're managing your assets. So from that perspective, I think, you know, they're very simple questions in some respects, but they give you a really meaningful uh, answer. And I think to finish, don't underestimate the mindset change that we have to have. Like I said, we have to break the paradigm. We have to make sure that we change people's views that it's just about hydrocarbons or major accident hazard. It, it is about that. But if you want to manage these complex assets, yes, they might be unmanned, but they're not unmanned all of the time. And the assets can still provide that potential harm to people and the environment through an uncontrolled release of energy. And it's about identifying that and really you know, working as one team to manage it going forward. Thank you very much. Marcus, thank you very much. That was a enlightening discussion uh, and we have got lots of questions um, for the next session. So thank you very much. So our last session today is a Q&A with all the panel speakers. So we have um, Simon Burward from ERM, Marcus, who you've just heard from, from RWE, Trevor Johnson from HSE and Dr. Stephen Bater, uh, who talked about the Energy Institute framework for managing process safety. So we're going to um, look at the Q&A and then as you can see we've got a few questions in there to get started. Uh, I also have a couple for the team myself. Um, but Simon, just to get kicked off, I think uh, just going back to that first session, there was a question that you had asked Treasure, uh, Trevor about the risks in renewable energy. Um, and there's a request that we kind of repeat the answer or, or your thoughts on, on what those are. That's why I mute myself, I do apologise. Yeah, it obviously varies massively from, from different types of renewables. So the risk profile for things like uh, solar is going to be completely different to, to a wind farm. Um, things like hydrogen is probably going to be the most analogous to existing hazards that you uh, that need to be managed on a, a hydrocarbon facility and so it, there are lots of different ones the HSC does have some good guidance again on its website on the specific hazards that should be looked at for uh, for different renewables so I guess the answer is it, it, it depends they're, they're very massively um, uh, dependent on the uh, yeah the different type of renewable energy that's been uh, that's been handled thanks Simon and just following on from that question uh, probably uh, Trevor for you and for uh, Stephen, is there guidelines on the main techniques that are used for ris risk identification and assessment? You know, things like HAZOP, SIL classification and verification. There's a question from Gianluca. Um, so, sorry, this, can you just repeat the question? No problem, Trevor. Are there guidelines on the main techniques that are used for risk identification and assessment? You know, things like hazard, safe op, the SIL classification, etc. Oh, yes, yes, there are, um, and there's many different sources. I think the Energy Institute has a number of really good uh, documents on this. But also, if you go onto the HSE website and you look under, you just uh, search for process safety, you'll, you'll find some really interesting stuff on that to, to guide you through. Uh, particular things uh, and, and the like, but the, uh, certainly for HAZOP studies and HAZED studies and the bow tie studies, there's an awful lot of really good information out there. 
and, and you know you know listening to Marcus Marcus how he how they've applied that into the renewal industry just goes to show that the basics are there it's it's just understanding the risk profile within this particular sector which enables you to use those tools to the maximum benefit Stephen anything you'd like to add to that no again from my perspective Lisa and for the team that this this is a systematic approach. You just got to be aware of it. The tools and techniques are there, and they can be made bespoke to the organisation. You haven't got to take it all. The framework is a high level framework. The tools and techniques maybe originated in oil and gas and petrochem, but they still are used and they are applicable for the renewable energy sector. So I strongly advocate everyone to familiarise with them. And implement this system because it does do as it says on a tin. It actually works and don't be the industry lead that ends up having this major catastrophe. If you don't know, ask, reach out, take advice, and implement a robust process for process safety management in renewables in your sector. Uh, and Stephen, I think you just touched on one of the questions that I see on the chat from Lee Alford, which is around in regards to that framework that you presented. You know, should renewable companies just take on all 20 elements or is this a pick and choose exercise? It's, it's basically, it's, in my opinion, it's, uh, my experience of implementing this fully, but also partially. It's a menu driven approach that if you look at it, for, for example, if we look at the more high hazard aspects of renewables, maybe hydrogen, anaerobic digesters, these kind of big plants, major hazard scenarios then my, my advice would be to fully implement the framework in its entirety. For the other, there was a question about smaller scale, then maybe you're looking at the safety critical elements, the management of change, and some of the other nuanced elements of the framework would be less appropriate. So again, it, it's down to the individual risk assessment of the organization and collaborating within the professionals in the sector and the field. Uh, but I'll be honest with you guys, this, it does work. It's been developed by the profession for the profession, and I strongly advocate to the guys who are working in renewables, especially the more high hazard end of it, to make themselves aware, take advantage of the training materials out there, the energy, you've got a fantastic online program that's aligned to it as well, the tools and techniques, as I said in my presentation, in my experience, if it's measured, it's managed, and you, you don't have to have or learn the lessons of the past. You can actually short circuit these cat catastrophes and have a robust system that actually makes your fiscal targets as well. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, Marcus. Maybe I'll just make a point on that. I think from our experience, don't be afraid to simplify to begin with and to change terminology if it scares people, mm. particularly for the smaller organisations. If you look at the intent behind the tools within the framework, you can adopt those. And if it's a case of, you know, well, we're a small outfit, we don't have many people that understand this subject, then engage with people that are going to be able to put it into your language for your business and for your part of the industry. You get far more buy in from people if they put it into their language. Um, so, you know, you get a lot of these um, setups, you know, I've, over the years, has op, has con it's been called safety studies, it's been called hazard studies. I hear all sorts of terminology around this. But actually, when you peel the, the, the label off and say, what's the, the intent behind it? You can call it whatever you want. Mm. It's just as long as you manage the intent. That's what I would say to people. No, that's a, that's a great question, a great feedback, uh, Marcus, from your experience there at RWE. Thank you. Lisa, and actually, sorry, with... Lisa, can I just add as well? Yes, yeah, certainly, Trevor. I think Mark, what Marcus said is really interesting and really valuable in that. And again, I always make the point that, that it's actually the outcome which is more important and having that confidence that you can demonstrate that you've achieved the point of safety that you need to do. These tools help you to do that. Uh, of that, there's no doubt. Use the right language, as Marcus says. But for, for me as a regulator, the most important thing is that you actually do, can demonstrate that the, 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 the thing is safe. I yeah, completely agree. It is the outcome. And, and certainly that's the way our, our legislation is written as well, isn't it? Our framework. OK, uh, so Marcus, coming back to you, there's a question on the chat from Jan Luca um, regarding renewable asset safety. And the question is, what are the main ways you ensure the design of the renewable asset is safe and operable? 
we don't just let designers loose on the design that's the first thing um we make sure that we actually have design teams that have input from not just those that are developing the projects but we have operational people embedded in the design teams and hsc people as well um and i think what that gives is a more broader um scenario base question set you've got the ops person the hsc saying well if you design it they what about this what if this happens actually we in practical we need that you know a good example we had one this week where we're talking about a hatch on a, on a substation um and the ops person saying to the designers you know well that's great but my major component i need to lift through there won't fit so mm. we need to make the dimensions bigger it's a really about having the adult conversation and, and seeing that they're all part of that design team that it's not just the, the responsibility and accountability of a single designer it's about making sure that you've got that input to make the design practicable and also it's going to protect the people and the environment you know when it's constructed and operated i think that's the key thing we've also done a, done it for another reason which is we've unfortunately had to decommission some assets early and it was an extremely painful process because i think when you know and you know we'll talk about oems but even when the oems originally started in this industry designing everybody was so excited to install assets i don't think we really thought about what would we do in 25 years when we take them down so when you've got a design philosophy that says um, decommission is take it down in the reverse order you've constructed it it's not very helpful so we're really starting to look at that aspect as well with the designers and really recognizing the, the design interfaces whether that's internally or whether that's externally as well so we think a more collaborative approach around a traditional design house uh, works far better i wholeheartedly agree i think the the that cross-functional team from people on the front line right through to the experts subject matter experts is essential for for good design for sure and just having that continuous lessons learned loop in place as well okay so a question from neil smith um and it's about the oecd corporate governance for protest safety and the question is do you recommend senior executives and companies read the oecd corporate governance for process safety Simon, let me turn to you first, I think, on this one. Yeah, I, I think the quick answer is, is yes. Um, I think, you know, at a, a top executive level, it's important, it's clearly important to have at least an appreciation of process safety management, even if you're not going to be directly involved in the, you know, the day-to-day -day management of it. But essentially, the responsibility starts at the top and, and therefore having that appreciation is, is, is vital. I agree. Trevor, anything you'd like to add to this one? I think it's really important that uh, you know, those, you know, the direct level chief executives and that they, they do understand the risks that their business operate. I don't, you know, that I think that is different than not knowing the absolute detail. And I, mm -hmm. I, and I think, you know, to, 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 to re reiterate Marcus's point, it's getting the messages in the right language so that the, the, the senior leaders of organisations fully understand the risk and therefore invest properly, both in terms of uh, process control, but also the people who operate as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think from my side, Lisa, absolutely, I would encourage it, but I would also say you've got to use the right language with the right leaders, particularly yeah. when it comes to you know CFO and CCO, commercial and financial people. So. Yeah, that, that would be my experience also, Marcus. You know, it's it's one thing just putting a document in front of people and asking them to read versus explaining that some of the context behind it, for sure. I think just one final thing on that as well, Lisa, is, is the timing. I think Trevor mentioned earlier on, I think having the risks identified and implementing the framework as early as possible in a project is, is critical. And that's, um, certainly consideration should be placed on, on the senior executives as well as, you know, the engineering team. I agree. So I'm going to come to everybody on this next question because I think it's very it's relevant for everybody and I, I really like your opinion on it because it's about lessons learned. 
And we talk a lot about lessons learned and, and David and a couple of others in the chat have, have posted a question around what is the industry doing about sharing lessons learned from incidents in the same way as CSB do with their process safety investigations? Um, and I know we've, uh, we've uh, probably had a couple of different opinions on, on how well we're doing here, but I'm curious from the panel what your, what your thoughts about sharing lessons learned are. And Marcus, let me start with you, I think. I'm going to try and not get on my soapbox at this point. <laughs> um, the problem is with most organisations, and I include my own in this because we're having active discussions as part of our integration planning. People talk about lessons learned and what they actually mean is lessons captured. And you're then wholly reliant upon the, the corporate mind of the people being still enrolled to say, oh, I remember in 2014 when we had this incident because there isn't really a learning depository that you can search and you know, pull that information down. I think that is true of most organisations. You then take it outside of the individual organisation to the industry and I think areas like Toolbox, which the Energy Institute use, has helped. I think organisations like the G Plus and Safety On have helped. Are we there? Not, not where anywhere where we should be, I don't think. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, in some respects, people just get frustrated by it. So they, it's one of the difficult challenges. So if it's difficult, we won't deal with it. And I think, you know, it's in some respects, the elephant in the room that we as an industry, we have a great opportunity to learn. And, and let's face it, you know, the oil and gas sector, it took major incidents for them to learn. Um, you know, many years ago, and we don't want to be in that position. So for me, it is a soapbox of mine. It is one I preach internally and externally, but I think we have to get better. But also we need to recognise that some of the successes, you know, one of the, the, the massive benefits of being a G plus member, and I say this as one of the, the original, you know, meeting uh, sort of invites back 10 years ago. So if I look at the journey that we've been on as a G plus, and the open sharing of information between OEMs and client developers, I think that is unprecedented to, you know, in my view. And I think it's absolutely where we are, you know, yes, we have commercial contracts, but you know, on HSE matters now, we are having very open dialogues about design and lessons learned and incidents. And I think, you know, that has to be also applauded as well, because that is, as I said, in, in, from my experience of the last 30 years in HSC, I've not seen that in any other sector. So for that, I think, you know, we should at least applaud that, but we do need to get better, that's for sure. And Trevor, this must be a point of frustration for you also with the with the role you have in the industry. Yeah, ab 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 absolutely. I think and I, I, I agree with much of what Marcus has said. I, I would just add a few points. I do think it's got better. It, it has got to get better still. And you say there are a number of vehicles like G Plus who, who, who provide that opportunity to do that. And I know they are doing it. It just needs to be better. And I think that, that's right. The other, the, the, the other couple of points I would make is it, the big frustration I find is when people use words like, no, uh, you know, uh, it's, oh, it's IP. We can't give you that information because it's we, we own that information. And, that. and again, I think it's about time that some organisations and I'm going to borrow a phrase from my wife, you know, put the big boy pants on and actually just started to realise health and safety is is a common topic which, uh, where information needs to be uh, shared uh, and that's for the benefit of all within the industry. You can't, you can't keep hiding behind uh, a, a, a pillars and posts and, and, and that not share the right information. The other thing, the final point I would make is that we can also learn when things go well. I think sometimes we only look at when things go wrong and learning the lessons from that. Um, I think we can, it's equally as beneficial and actually it's more rewarding to actually listen when we've done something well and we learn the lessons from that so that we follow that process again so we're not always reinventing the wheel. I think that's a great point. We don't often realise sometimes that we are receiving lessons learned when they are positive. So for example, you know, the the information we just received from, from Marcus about how, how RWE have approached process safety is, is in itself a lesson learned, but we're not always uh, so quick to recognise things for what they are. That's a great point, Trevor. Simon, any thoughts on this one? 
I think I, I really like Marcus's point that, you know, this should be viewed with renewables as an opportunity more than anything. You know, we've got an opportunity to do better. We can uh, lean on, you know, vast years of data to, to help guide us in, uh, in managing process safety and renewables. So, yeah, I, I really like the idea of it as, a, uh, as an opportunity more than anything else. And Stephen, from from your perspective, you know, thinking of KPIs and and all the work that you've done in the in your last twenty years. Again, from a problem. From my perspective, Lisa, it's, it's learning. It's literally continually improving, being open and transparent as best you can within legal constraints, being proactive, and learning from other industry sectors. Don't learn all, almost on the job by having your own mistakes. There's a lot of literature out there, there's a lot of information out there with parallel industries. You know, you've had incidents with explosions that could be relevant from oil and gas, but they could be relevant for that anaerobic digestion, for example. Uh, you've got vessel collisions, you've got offshore oil and gas, you've got thing. The oil and gas industry had a fantastic approach to flash alerts. It didn't give um, details into the litigation areas, I suppose you could argue, but it gives industry professionals an opportunity to do a review of their own operations and learn and maybe implement a few quick measures to check that you're all operating safely, etc. So my advice is follow a robust framework, Lisa, be proactive, but be open and honest and, and learn and accelerate the improvements you need to, to make in your sector. As you're the old guys, you know what you're doing, work with the regulators, work with your stakeholders, so we prevent these terrible tragedies that affect everyone, do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. Uh, another great question here from David Hatch, um, which I'm quite curious about, um, Marcus, your input on here. And it says, are there plans to create standard taxonomy, taxonomy for assets and controls so that trends in bow tie threat occurrence and barrier degradation can be identified? And addressed across the industry rather than each business. And I guess this the reason I'm interested in your input is because you you already spoke about you know change the language to suit your audience a little bit. So how would we get around this? And is this something you think would be of benefit? I think a Marcus Peters view would be yes. <laughs> my RWE view, because I would have to ask my colleagues, but I think absolutely it would. But I think we also have to recognise the maturity level of the organisations we're part of. That would sit squarely with, I think, either the Energy Institute or the G Plus to really mm -hmm. achieve that. Um, currently, the G Plus is very focused on occupational safety. Through the Safe by Design programme, um, we've started to step into more asset related territory. Um, and I think it's probably on the next maturity step for that. But I think we're still uh, trying to really engage on a number of safe by design issues. And, and there is a safe by design workshop coming up uh, in a few weeks. But realistically, I think um, in the long term, yes, we should have some sort of framework that links to the wider EI framework, but maybe mm -hmm. into more language for renewables that, 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 that it couldn't it couldn't you know not help the situation that's for sure because yeah, the was bigger hard. players i think like you know ge and rwe and uh, you know edf and the people like that will automatically get the subject but for the smaller players they might not and i think it would be helpful for that so yes absolutely Trevor, is this something that the that you or the the HSE in general are, are looking at? Um, I think I think this is I I, I actually think I, again I think Marx is absolutely right. This is a real opportunity for uh, G Plus and Safety On to 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 take the lead, take into account the you know the uh, comments from within uh, from within you know their members. Really, I think this is a real. I really do think it's a big, big opportunity for uh, those organisations to provide even further leadership. You know, and and let's be honest with you, over the last few years, they've certainly provided a lot of uh, health and safety leadership within uh, uh, the offshore and onshore wind industry. And that, but I think it's another great opportunity for them. So we're getting close to the the top of our hour here, or top of our half hour. 
Um, so I've got a couple of questions I'd like to just ask the full panel, just as in means of a wrap up. Um, and the first one is, you know, if process, if a process safety framework works, why isn't everyone using it already? You know, what is holding people back? And Simon, I'm going to start with you on this question. Yeah, that's a good question. Is yeah, you know, in in my experience as a as a consultant and um, organisations that don't implement a, a process safety framework, I, I think it essentially just intimidated by the, the scope of it. I think mm -hmm. you know there's the up to twenty different items that need to be addressed as part of a, a conclusive framework, and I, and I think um, it's almost a case of not wanting to start because you know you don't know where it's going to go, you know. How do I address this section? Which one is a priority? And I think that's why it's so important to have you know dedicated people to these um, to these organisations. And I think also there's a bit of a misconception as to how much depth one needs to go into for each individual sort of part of this framework. You know, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be you know pages and pages of documentation sitting on a shelf somewhere, which is not particularly helpful to anybody. Um, I think. I, I favor taking a risk-based approach rather than a sort of prescriptive approach to these things, um, which which can help kind of uh, at least make make a process safety management system look a bit more manageable. Great answer, Stephen. Okay, from my perspective, Lisa, absolutely fantastic question. I ask myself that every minute of my waking day that. The tools and techniques are there. When they are implemented appropriately, they do the job and they keep people safe. They protect the environment and they stop companies damaging their reputations and impacting on their fiscal returns. Do you know what I mean? So it is complex. I do believe there's an opportunity to sort of uh, make it more appropriate with more case studies. Get the guys, as you said earlier, about sharing the excellent work that organizations are doing in this space. And maybe some, you know, sort of more, sort of like, how can I say, driven from making it more prescriptive, as in the regulators are seeing good and the regulators are seeing bad. So maybe they need to be enforcing things in a slightly different way. That's my own, on my own soapbox, maybe, because as I say, I've introduced it. I've done articles and case studies with colleagues within the Energy Institute. And, yeah. and it does what it says on the tin. And it is the best kept secret, the energy process safety management framework. It ain't <laughs> as complex as you want to make it, guys. It's quite easy. It's quite systematic. The new publications should help. The guidelines are very reader friendly. And you can choose what's appropriate to your risk profile. That's my view, Lisa. Hope it helps. It does. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Trevor, uh, just a, a quick sum up from you on this question. I, 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 in the 30 odd years I've been you know, working for HSC, the one thing I've seen is gradual improvement and gradual change. From where we were 30 years ago, where no one even knew what a risk assessment really looked like, to where we are now with risk management techniques far, far better. And they will continue to improve, and hopefully this does too. And Marcus? Yeah, I just think for me, you know, we don't have to come make things too complex keep it simple start simple make it complex afterwards but get people in, engaged and bought into the subject um, that's where i would well thank you everybody for your insights uh, i think this idea of speed of the enormity of the task and just starting simple is the, the a great message to to finish on today on this q a session so thank you everybody for joining. Um, and thank you to my speakers, first and foremost, Simon Burward, Marcus Peters, Trevor Johnson, and Dr. Stephen Bater. Uh, thank you for your questions, participation in this chat. Um, we've learned a lot today. We've covered a lot of ground in the last hour and a half, including why process safety is important, how leaders can make process safety part of their operational transformation program, where you can access toolkits and the framework. We've also heard about how to get started, a practical approach shown the RWA way forward, uh, and other ways you can use Bowtie, for example, in audits. So thank you everybody for joining. I uh, appreciate your time today. You will hear, you will receive a link for a recording of this session after the event. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.